The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. You probably remember that uh, that story about the poor guy that uh, had his fiance break his heart, yeah, and when she gave him back his ring and broke the engagement. A few weeks later, though, he received a note from from her, begging for mercy and a, and a plea to be reconciled. And her note read, Sweetheart, no words could ever, ever express the great unhappiness I have felt since breaking our engagement. Please say that you'll take me back. No one could ever take your place in my heart, so please forgive me. I love you. I love you. I love you so much. Yours forever. And then she signed her name. And below her signature, she added a P.S. P.S. Congratulations on winning the state lottery. <laughs> <laughs> well, it all sounded good until I got to the P.S., but isn't that how many of us are? I mean, we profess that we love God. We come to Sunday morning and say, I love you, Lord. Then uh, we do this and hope that God was, is going to somehow reward us for our devotion. But you and I know that seeking God's mercy is not an exercise of horse trading. We know that God's grace is given graciously generously, and that means with no strings attached. And so when we sang our psalm this morning, if we sang it and, and worshipped with it, we realized it's a lot like the blessing that we give at the end of the sermon. I mean, the psalmist wrote, may God be merciful to us and bless us. And may the light of God's face shine on us. It almost sounds like what I say at the end of the service, doesn't it? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. But remember that when, when the Jews sang this song in the temple, or now in their worship in the synagogues, they understood that they were being blessed to be a blessing. Now, when you read all the commentaries and what scholars say, they say that this probably was a song that was used in worship because if you look at verse 3 and 5, it sounds like a, a responsive reading. The congregation reads back, Let the peoples praise you, O God, let all the peoples praise you. But the thing that I discovered, and it was sort of, a, sort of strange to me because the scholars are so very meticulous, on determining who wrote a psalm and, and why and when they wrote it. <clears throat> they have no idea who wrote it or when it was written. But its liturgical sense seems to be that it was way, way back in the beginning of the faith. I mean, it might have been that they sang the psalm when they were wandering around in the wilderness seeking God's mercy, seeking God's grace to lead them to the promised land. Or it could have been when David was king, or when Solomon opened the temple and dedicated it. Or it could have been to the exiles who were in Babylon. And certainly we know that it was used in the temple of Jesus. But the thing that's very clear in this song, that under any circumstance, I mean, even to us today, this song is pertinent. God judges the world with equity and guides us. And when God's way in saving health is present among all nations, then the whole earth will bring forth its increase and in blessing. So you can almost imagine that this psalm was, was sung 
in our prophecy today. And many scholars say that this is the so-called third Isaiah. Because Isaiah couldn't have possibly been alive when this was written. But it was probably one of his students. And when the Jews returned to the Holy Land, this song or this prophecy was given. Maintain justice and do what is right. For soon my salvation will come and my deliverance will be revealed. This proclamation is so different from the one that we just read two weeks ago from Isaiah 55. When, when the so-called second Isaiah spoke to the exiles in Babylon. And he wrote, You that have no money, come and buy and eat. Come and buy wine and milk without money and without price. And why, why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? And your labor for that which is not, does not satisfy? In 2 Isaiah, it's clear that the writer wanted the Jews to have hope. To, to realize that God's love and mercy were steadfast. And then today, to the returning exiles, the writer is proclaiming the same hope and grace and forgiveness. But it's not just for the Jews. It's to the whole world. And Isaiah writes, And to the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to Him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be His servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane, profane it and hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. And thus says the Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel. I will gather others besides those already gathered. Now wait a minute. Did I read that right? You mean way back in Isaiah, God was saying that his good news was not just for the Jews, <clears throat> but it was for all people. It's strange, isn't it? That almost sounds like Paul. Because Paul said that Gentiles, foreigners, are as much a, a part of the plan of God's salvation as the Jews are. And that's why when we read Paul today, we pick it up sort of in the middle. But when we read that, it, it says that the Jews' rejection of Jesus doesn't cut them off. And Paul asks, or writes, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. And then he goes on and says, God hasn't rejected his people whom he foreknew. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. And in the verses from Romans that we skipped this week, I mean, from verse 2 on, Paul uses the lesson that we read last week. When, when we heard Elijah complaining that he, he couldn't go on and that he alone was, al that he was alone the only one that was faithful. And God says, wait a minute. There are 7,000 faithful people. Paul's point in referring to that is that God is reliable. God's faithful. God is constant and consistent. And even though the Jews have rejected Jesus Christ, God hasn't rejected the Jews, as so many of us Christians claim. Even though it's hard for us to see right now how that can happen, Paul claims in Galatians 
that through God's mercy and grace and wisdom, that there is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer a slave or free. There is no longer male or female. For all of you are one in Christ, and there is no distinction. And last week, Paul told us in Romans 10, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek or Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all, and is generous to all who call on Him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How can we Christians say that today? I mean, how dare we say that? Look at, look at the headlines. And look at all the chaos in the Mideast. Hamas and every fundamentalist Muslim terrorist organization has as a basic principle the annihilation of the Jewish state. And those people say that God has told them that. What, what do we believe? Who do we trust? Do we trust the human mind or human circumstances? Or do we trust the mind of God? Paul tells us in verse 25 that to the human mind, all of this is a mystery. And then he reminds us in verses 28 and 29, as far as God's election is concerned, the Jews are loved on account of the patriarchs, for God's gifts and God's call are irrevocable. How is that possible? I had no idea. But I don't have to explain it. Why? Because I know that God is merciful and gracious and abounds in steadfast love. And I, or President Obama, or the United Nations, or Hamas, are not in control. God's in control. But then our lesson that we read in the Gospel seems sort of strange. Because it's, it makes Jesus seem as though the gospel is just for Jews, doesn't it? But he starts out, I mean, he's fighting with everybody. Because in the verses before our lesson, the Jews, the, the Pharisees and, and teachers of the law have accused him of eating without washing his hands. And that's why Jesus says, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person. But it's what comes out of the mouth that defiles. And that's why his disciples said, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? Because Jesus is implying that those scholars, those teachers of the law, and those Pharisees are living unclean lives. And then he quotes Isaiah. This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And then Peter asks for an explanation. And Jesus answers, Don't you see that whatever goes into your mouth enters the stomach and then goes out into the sewer? Flush. But what comes out of the mouth, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this is what defiles. And then he goes and lists that long list of things that defile our, that come out of our heart. Now, it's strange then, doesn't it? Because the lesson stops there, and then all of a sudden, Jesus is going off to Tyre and Sidon. And, you know, we, if we 
looked it up and everything and, and found out Tyre and Sidon are in a completely different country. It's in Phoenicia. And it's well known to be a pagan stronghold. And then, so Jesus leaves the land of the Jews and goes to this Gentile place. And then this Canaanite woman comes up to him and demands, have mercy on me, Lord, son of, of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. And there's a whole lot of stuff that we could unwrap from that, but I won't do that right now. And the disciples can't get rid of this woman. And Jesus finally tells her, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then the lesson seems to indicate that, that she softens. And then she kneels before Jesus and pleads, Lord, help me. And Jesus' answer seems so out of character. Because he tells her, it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But despite that insult, I mean, because that's an insult. He's calling her a dog. The woman responds, yes, yes, Lord. But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Now, why are these two disjoint stories together? It seems as though Matthew is trying to help us see the contrast between so-called holy people and a Gentile sin. He's, Matthew wants us to see the contrast between self-righteous arrogance and judgmentalism and to see the Canaanite woman's helpless humility. And while Jesus condemned the Pharisees, <coughs> he blesses the Canaanite woman for her humility. Woman, Great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed and so. That's why it's so important for me to begin the service with the confession of forgiveness. Because we're like that Canaanite woman. Saying, Lord, have mercy on me. I'm not worthy. And in a sense, our lesson, our lessons have taken us full circle. Because in Isaiah, the returning exiles are called to renew that covenant that was made for the patriarchs. They were blessed to be a blessing. Abraham was blessed to be a blessing, not just to his descendants but to the entire world. And these exiles were given a vision which were originally given to Abraham. You know, the, the promise that Abraham got was he would have land, he would have descendants, and then he would be blessed. And that blessing would extend to all the world. And that's why Paul could see that the rejection of the Jews of, of God's salvation through Jesus Christ was not eternal. But it was temporary. So that God's grace and mercy would extend to all the world. To you and me who are not Jews. And then that would bring to fruition 
the promise that God made with Abraham thousands of years ago. Jesus encounters the Pharisees and the Canaanite woman. And that and those encounters demonstrate us, demonstrate to us how human understanding and, and, and interpretation are sometimes in contradiction to what God really wants from us. And in Isaiah again, God, or Isaiah proclaims that God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. God doesn't demand perfection from us. If God demanded perfection, then all of us would be condemned to death and to burn in hell. God's Son wasn't sent into this world to condemn the world, but to save it. And that's why maybe the only way that I can end the sermon is to reread or paraphrase Psalm 67. May God be merciful and bless us. May the light of God's face shine on us. Let God's way be known upon you, and God's saving help among all nations. Let all the nations be glad and sing for joy, for God judges the people with equity and guides all the nations to glory. And the earth has brought forth its increase. God, our own God, has blessed us. And may God give us blessing. And let all the ends of the earth stand in awe. What do we say to that? And that's why verses 3 and 4 may be the only response. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. And when we say that, let us remember that we are blessed. We are blessed. We are so blessed. But that also means that we are to bless others. Amen. Amen.